Today is Wednesday, July 9th, 2003. Uh, this is the beginning of an interview with Rachel Lehman. Ms. Lehman was in the uh, United States Army during World War II, and she was in the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, or the WACs. Uh, this interview is being conducted at the Atlanta History Center. My name is Frederick Wallace. I am with AARP and I am the interviewer. Ms. Lehman, as I explained earlier, we want you to relate your military service experience for the American people. Take us from the date of your enlistment in the service, tell us why you enlisted, to your uh, boot camp experience and from boot camp, how did you travel from boot camp to your permanent duty station? And then tell us what your experience was once you got to your permanent duty station. So, Ms. Lehman, this is your story. Will you begin, please? Well, I lived in Miami Beach when war broke out. At that time, I had a beachwear shop on Miami Beach. And when war broke out, the area that I lived in, the hotels in that section were all taken over by the Army for their training. The area that I lived, that I had my shop, was where the men who were officer training were housed. And I had a shop beachwear shop where I sure couldn't sell beachwear to the men who were in training, but a friend of mine had a shop at the lower end of Miami Beach. And what he did in his shop, he put in all the men's uh, uniforms. And so I said to him, why don't you take your uniforms, put them into my shop, where my area, where the men are training for officers, your part of the area where you were living was for the enlisted men. But my area is where you should be. Let's find out if you can put your merchandise into my store. In the meantime, my lease was running out. And here I am making so much money from the boys that were coming into service and they were being fitted for their uniforms for officer training. And it hurt me that I'm making money on these boys that might not even come back. It hurt me very much until I decided I don't need all this money. I have nobody. I'm all by myself, no children, no nothing. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this up and I am going to enlist in the WAC. And because one thing about enlisting in the WAC, you can travel. And that's what I wanted to do. So I gave, I, so we arranged with the owner of the store, turned my lease over to this other van. I left, went to New York because my mother and family lived in New York City. I went to New York City and I went to the headquarters of the Army headquarters and filed papers for enlistment. But at that time I was over the age for the WAC enlistment. The age limit then was 39. I was already 41. So I was over the age for that. But I insisted, I said, I want to join, there's nobody in my family that can be in service. And another thing, I said, do you remember that picture of Uncle Sam that said, I need you? He was pointing to me. So I, I filed an app, and so they said, well, you're over the age, but since I was so insistent, if you pass the mental and the physical test, We'll find out. What happened? I took the mental, I took the physical, and I passed. And they waived the age limit, and I went in. Then, when we got the orders to go where you're supposed to, and to um, 
sign in, which was down on Whitehall Street at that time in New York City. And I got my orders of the telegram and I went down there and we signed, signed in. You, you only carry your civilian clothes, just what you can use that day or whatever it was. And off we went on a train. We didn't know, we were a group of, these were all women. We didn't know where we were going, but the train, that's another thing, the train with double bunks, and they put me in the upper bunk, and I'm afraid of height, and I'm in the upper bunk, afraid that I'll roll over. <laughs> and we always ask the porter, where are we going? Where? Because we? we didn't know. And he said, well, I think we're going west. We landed, oh, at that time, <clears throat> the reason that I enlisted from New York, from, I didn't want to enlist from Florida because at that time they opened a WAC training center in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, and I did not want to go to Georgia. And that's why I went to New York to enlist, thinking if I go to New York, they had a WAC training center, Des Moines, Iowa, uh, that's for me. But we're traveling, and finally we get to our destination. They had just opened a third WAC training center, Daytona Beach, Florida. So here I am, back in Florida, which was good because it was January, because in January I didn't want to be in Des Moines, Iowa. So we're back in Daytona Beach, where we had six weeks of basic training. And of course, at basic training, you are doing KP. And I used to write to my mother, and I used to tell her that the pots that we have to wash, I could stand up straight in it, they're so big. But we had six weeks of basic training. Now, basic training are all different classes that you attend, gas masks jumping, drill. I was assigned to a drill one day, and what did I do? I took my group into a fence. That was so funny. Of course, we made a big joke out of that. But that's what drilling you is. You were the drill sergeant? Well, in basic, you're a little of everything. And so at one point, it was your turn to, my turn. to conduct and the drill. And instead of telling them uh, column right or column left, I said straight right into a fence. <laughs> then, so we had a lot of training. Now, usually when you're in basic training, from basic training, you're assigned to your permanent post where you shift out different places. The group that I was with, when we graduated basic, they were going to use our group for a guinea pig. And instead of sending us into the field, they sent us right into our spot, Fort Dix, New Jersey. That was the extent of my traveling. But that was all right, because my family lived in New York, which was one hour from Fort Dix. Trenton was one hour, or Philadelphia was one hour, so that was all right. So I was spent three years at Fort Dix. Now, I was always in supply. Let me uh, back up a bit. How did you travel from uh, your uh, basic training base to Fort Dix? By train again. By train. By train. Again. And were you alone, or were there several no, other women with group, you? No, our whole group that were going to be based at Fort Dix. And, you know, there's 50 to a barracks. So, and your, your barracks are according to your initial, how you house. What was your reaction to basic training? Did you think that you had made the a basic mistake training once for you me got was in? very hard because, for one thing, I had to get used to wearing shoes. You know, living in Miami Beach, I wore sandals. You know, that's all you wear there. Now, I really had to get used to the, that hard leather shoes which later on was just so wonderful, the best thing I ever had. But that was in the beginning, it was very hard for me to wear shoes, having worn sandals practically all the time I lived in Miami. What and else was hard about basic training? Sir? What else was difficult about basic training? 
Well, we, uh, they were, uh, then they assigned you to your permanent post and they put me into the insurance department. No, I was speaking of the basic training. You said it was very oh, basic, hard. basic, basic, that's at Daytona Beach. You're talking yeah. about Daytona Beach right. now. Uh, because we had a lot of uh, schooling, classes, everyday classes, different classes, different things that you had to know about. Read, 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 and then we had, it was like going back to school again. You had to write whatever you learned, if you did, and gas mask. And Who were your instructors? Did you have male instructors or female instructors? We had female. Well, very hard. I think they were worse than the men, these women. They were really tough because they had already been in the Army when it first started. And they were really tough gals, really were. But you go through and, um, but basic was, it turned out all right, for one thing because it was Florida and it was January. And then we shipped up to, to, the, to Fort Dix. And then at Fort Dix, I was put into the insurance department where, well, I knew as much about insurance as the man in the moon did. But they don't put, like, I, I was in supply all my life. Put me back in supply where I can measure somebody, the size and all. The Army doesn't work that way. You know, the Army works differently. <laughs> and um, what happened at Fort Dix, the girl that was, see, we went according to our initial. My, my, middle, my maiden name was Rosen, R-O-S-E-N. And the girl next to me was Rosen, R-O-S-S-O-N, Fonda Rosen. And Fonda used to come back from mess, the night mess, and talk about the wonderful meal her sergeant made her, and the wonderful this that she ate, and this that. I couldn't eat. I'd walk into the mess hall and I would turn my stomach. If I couldn't, the food had smelled awful and I lost a lot of weight. So they decided since I lost so much weight, I was gonna, they were gonna send me out. And I said, I'm not leaving the army. I said, I came in here healthy and I'm going out healthy. Send me to a farm, which well, they did. They sent me to a farm in Pennsylvania for 15 days furlough. And then I put on the weight and came back. But I was still envious of this other girl who was talking about the food she eats, because she was with the mess. And so one day I said to her, I'd like to come into your office and you know meet your major, whoever it was. So I went with her one day and he said to me, put me aside, he said, what does she have for breakfast, lemon juice? She was a real sour person. Didn't want to be in the army, like a lot of girls didn't want to be. They didn't belong, but so man managed to get out. But she didn't make any effort to get out, but was just mean, very mean. And that's what he, then when orders would come to ship out somebody, you had an MO, you had, a, your number was on an MOS. Were you in the army? No. I know what MOS means. You know what an MOS is. Yes. An MOS is what your rank is. My rank this was, was chief. specialty. A military rank. occupational specialty. Right. Chief. Yes. Mine was chief clerk. And when this M and I kept thinking, oh, I hope my MOS never comes out to get shipped overseas. My mother was sick then, because if God forbid something happens and I'm overseas. But the, my, my captain then, not my captain, because I wasn't with the mess, I was still with supply, an MOS came out and he said to, I happened to be in the office there and he said, I have an MOS to ship somebody out to so and so and so. He said, now I can send you or I can send her. I said, let me stay here, let me stay. He shipped her out. And I became charge of the mess. Then we had 200 mess halls that we were in charge of. And I was there three years with them. You were in charge of the mess hall? The mess hall. Consolidated mess. 
we fed everybody that came into Fort Dix. We fed everybody that was going out in the service at the mess hall at Fort Dix. Consolidated mess. When you say everybody, you're talking about male and female soldiers, is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Anybody that was coming in or going out. Well, so, did you have some kind of training to prepare you for this? No. No, you learn. You learn. I even learned how to type. <laughs> I got a book on typing, because I had to type letters and everything, so type up menus and all. You learn. You keep your eyes open. You said you wanted to travel, but when the occasion came for you to travel, you turned it down. Why? Because I didn't want to go away. My mother was sick then. And here I am, only one hour, God forbid if anything happens, I'm only one hour from there. But if I, they're sending me, usually what they did, they sent them overseas, because a group that was with me in my group and my captain went to Boston a, a, to be trained for shipping out of overseas and they shipped that group to Africa. And she, we used to get letters from her, and she said, you kids think you have it bad. Here we eat out of our helmets, mess, mess out of your helmets, bathe out of your helmets. And she said, you kids think you have it bad. <laughs> she did write back to her. What was living conditions like in uh, Fort Then, Dix? after I got into the mess, I had got another stat, another stripe, and I was assigned to a cadre room, which means we were just two girls in a room upstairs over the barracks, because in the barracks are 50, 25 and 25. So I had a cadre room with another girl who was from Kansas City, smart girl. She was a banker. <laughs> She, if anybody was short of money, she used to lend them money but charged interest. She was a former banker. <laughs> but uh, as far as my travel, well, I didn't, I was glad that my MOS never came up to ship me away somewhere. Then... So when you were, you made your additional rank and you moved into the cadre room. Yeah. So living conditions were much improved, is well, that right? Well, I'm a mess sergeant. I could go into the mess hall and say, Sergeant, I want a steak or I want potatoes, I want this or I want... Or he would call me up and he'd say, Sergeant, what can I fix for you today? So I was in heaven because I didn't have to eat the regular food that was being served. I couldn't eat it. Couldn't eat it. Then... Uh, war ended, and you had a choice of staying into service or of going out. And I decided, since I had, a, I would ha had not had it not been for my mother being ill, I would have made it my career, because I was very much for young people to enter service instead of going to work. At that time, Woolworths behind the counter or any other place behind a counter, go into service and stay in service. Then when the war ended, and so my, my, mate, my captain said, if you stay in, you'll get another stripe. But, so we had, and you know, when anybody coming into Fort Dix from overseas, you're under quarantine for, I don't remember, certain length of time, three days or three weeks, I really don't remember the time. And this one boy comes into my office and he said, Sergeant, I'd like to have a pass. I said, you can't have a pass. You just got in here three, three days ago or something like that. Well, my name is Paul Grossinger. Does that name mean anything to you? At that time, it didn't mean a thing to me because Paul Grossinger's mother had a resort in the Catskill Mountains, very famous, the Grossinger Catskills, very famous. And he says, I'm Paul Grossinger. Well, Paul, he could have said, 
I'm king of Siam. It meant nothing to me. I didn't call for those things. As I'm sorry, so, uh, private, you have to be in camp so many days before you can get a pass to go home. And the next thing I know, I got a phone call. Sergeant, this is Major so-and-so. You have a boy there that just got in, Paul Grossinger. I want you to issue him a pass. I said, Major, but Sergeant, I said, what could I do? I had to issue him a pass because Paul probably told him about his mother's hotel, when you come out, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> so, but that's how it worked. So then they said, when I was ready to leave, you're up for another strike. I said, you know, I'm going out of service. A strike to me means nothing. Let's give it to a boy who's staying in service, who it would, would mean something to him. I said, you know, this, this young fellow that just came in here, Paul Grossinger, that wants to go home, give it to him. You know, I go, I give it to him. And later on, after I met Paul Grossinger, later at his mother's hotel, he said, you know, she always refused me a, hotel, a pass. She wouldn't let me go on pass, no. So then I was... Most of the servicemen who you came into contact with were transients, were they? Or were they in the process of shipping out somewhere? Uh, uh, were they permanent they duty at uh, Fort per Dix? See, from Dix they went to their permanent base. Okay, but Fort Dix was Dix a, first. sort of a staging area. Yes, they came see. there first. And from there they went mm. to their permanent base. And most of the people that ate in the mess hall, what were the ranks? Were they all lower ranking? Uh, no, no, men? they were all the PFCs, private. These are coming into service. Mm -hmm. Privates. So they were the lower ranking lower, enlisted men, yeah, yes. They, this is not officer mess. Yeah. Officer mess was different. We took care of officer mess also, but that was different from what the mess halls that we, we were in charge yeah. of. Well, tell me, uh, as a female soldier, uh, what did you feel uh, was the, uh, the, the other soldiers think about you? They were very up against us, especially their mothers, because we came in and took office jobs where these boys could be doing it. But instead, we're sitting here on an office job and the boys are being sent into the field. So it was the mothers that were against us. Now, we were all, our group, we were always invited to dances to the other camps where the boys were stationed. We were invited. And this one boy that asked me to dance was very insulting, very insulting to me. Because I'm a whack and I have no business being in there and everything, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, how can I get rid of this kid who I'm dancing with him? How can I get rid of him? And then I saw this fellow passing by, and to me it looked like an older person. I said, oh, to the kid, I said, oh, excuse me, there's my friend. And I went over to that man, and I told him, I said, look, make believe you know me, please, make believe you know me. And that's when they let's get away because this kid, you know, there's a, there's a lot, not, a, not all of the boys, not all the boys, because I helped being in the position that I was in with the mess. If a troop train was going, to an area where I knew a boy I had lived in that came from that section, I made sure to give him a three-day pass to go home for three days. But I said, you have to be, you know, because we were falling out for Reveille at 5.45. I think that's why I left the army. I didn't want to get up at 5.45 anymore. <laughs> but I said, you have to be in that line for Reveille, 545. If you're not, I got to, to the, to the, uh, to the officer in charge. Right. Believe me, 545, the, those boys with boxes of candy and flowers, they're there in line because I let them, I'd be court-martialed 
for the things that I did for the boys. Really, I would do. the different things I thought. And this one, another lieutenant I had, he was like a Boy Scout, poor guy. He knew nothing about the Army and no more wanted the Army than the man in the moon. And he used to say, but Sergeant, he's not to a pass. I said, Lieutenant, you want a good soldier? Send this boy home. His wife was pregnant. I said, send this boy home for three days. Do you want a good soldier? So he said, oh, I don't know. But like I say, I, <laughs> if I, I'd be, I wouldn't be here, I'd be court-martial. When the soldiers came back you, from their overseas yes. bases, they came through uh, Fort, Fort Dix. Dix. Yeah. And did you talk with any of them? Oh, absolutely. What kind when, of stories the, that they tell? Uh, no, no, you don't, they don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. so. But when the boys came back, what I wanted was the company, the, their patch. I wanted their patch that mm -hmm. they wore. And I have a scrapbook with the patches and where they were from. I was going through my scrapbook the other day. I have a patch from a boy in Albany, Georgia. Now, one day, maybe through the internet or somewhere, the boy, of course, isn't living because that was, you know. But maybe family, way, way back somewhere, maybe somebody would love to have this boy's patch. And I'm gonna, one day when I have time. You still have his name? Oh, it's in my scrapbook, mm -hmm. definitely, mm -hmm. yes. Albany, Georgia. What was your most memorable experience, or your, 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 your memory, the most important memory that you retain from your service experience? Oh, there are so many things. <coughs> what stands out in your mind? Well, trying to uh, of course, I objected very much to this 545 falling out for Reveille in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was glad when I was up in the Cadbury room, I didn't have to do that anymore. I didn't have to stand, stay for PT, physical training. I didn't have to do that anymore because, well, it was good uh, being where I was, the rank that I was in. That was good. That's other than the dances, what other type of entertainment was oh, there? Oh, we had movies. We, could, we had movies there. And we were always invited to different camps for parties. We invited them to When you say different camps, do you mean different, different sections of different, the base? Different uh, parts of the... Of, the, of, of Fort yeah, Dix. Yeah. Not officers. Mm -hmm. Not officers. And a cousin of mine enlisted and was stayed, came to Fort Dix and he was a major and we couldn't even have lunch or anything together because he outranked me and my cousin. <laughs> and the the wax stayed in one different, uh, different section oh, of yes. the post from the men? Oh definitely, definitely. Off limits. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Off limits. Yes, they, they couldn't, and if, especially if you're on CQ, charge of quarters, and you see anything strolling around like that, you can report him right away. He's not due there, he doesn't belong there. No, we were very carefully guarded, very carefully guarded. And your senior officer was uh, a female as well? Uh, our, our senior officer, no. It, for the, uh, for the, uh, let me see what we had. We had a few, well, our major, the, who was a friend of Ovet, Ovita Culp Hobby, who used to come to our camp. It's her friend. She was a senior officer, too. Well, let me see, the senior officer, she would be a uh, major, not a colonel. Colonel Hobby, she was a girl, mm -hmm. she was a hobby. She was a major. Yes, I, I'm familiar but, with her name. 
Avita Kalpati. Right. And I have pictures in my scrapbook of her. Oh, if I brought my scrapbook, it would take up this whole table. <laughs> So other than the fact that your mother was ill, you think you would have made a career? Oh, definitely. The Absolutely. I would. In fact, I would have gone into recruiting at, when I came out, and because I'm, I'm very much for young people to do that, to go into service. You get discipline, you get you don't have to worry about drugs and stuff like that because that won't, you wouldn't last. And that's what I think that young people today should definitely go into service. And you, uh, you were single all the time, you were in the service. Yes. And uh, after you got out, did you get married after you got out? After I got out. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was married. I was divorced when I went into service. That was the first time. I was married three times. Mm -hmm. Hollywood can do it, I can do it. Of course. <laughs> no, I was, uh, I was divorced and the girls that were in my group, young, they, some went 18 years old, kids went in. And they had boyfriends and they didn't hear from them, they'd be crying and I said, I'm glad I don't have that, I don't want it, none of that business for me. You know, what did you do after you got out? Oh. Now Paul Grossing had told me his mother had this hotel in the mountains, in the Catskill Mountains, in the summertime and in the wintertime she had a hotel in Miami Beach, the Pancos Hotel. Uh, I remember the Pankos. And I'm coming out of service in January. I didn't want to live in New York City because I lived in Miami Beach most of my life and I wanted to go back to Miami Beach. Knowing his mother has a hotel and I said to him, I want to work, can I work at your mother's hotel? He said, when you get out, I'll call her and I'll tell her, put you to work. So I got down to Florida. I'm still in uniform because my clothes didn't come, my civilian clothing. I'm still in uniform. I got to Miami Beach, the hotel, went to his mother, and she put me into the hotel as cashier at the hotel. That was in the wintertime, which was beautiful. And in the summertime, they come to Miami Beach because they have a hotel in the summertime in Miami Beach, which for me was great. So in the wintertime, I'm in Florida, and in the summertime, I'm back up in New York again, which was great. And this went on for about three different seasons, back and forth, until I decided I didn't want to pack wintertime, pack summertime. I, I, it's, I've got to get permanent again. Permanent. So a friend of mine had opened a store in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, well, I don't know if I would be in charge of a ladies' dress shop, which was fine. I went in there and I was with this store until he went bankrupt. Well, it's a long story with him because he never paid rent, never paid the light bill. And uh, and I liked Fort Lauderdale. It was very the Fort Lauderdale then was what Miami Beach was when I first got there. Very nice, small. And I thought, this is a small town, it's a place for me. I looked around, I found a store, small. I said, well, I'm opening up a shop again. So I opened a children's shop, and I called it Rachel's Young Set in Fort Lauderdale. And I just wanted a store where I would manage it with one other salesperson. I didn't want a big thing, and I wanted one window to dress only one window instead of dressing two or three women, and I had a very, very nice little shop there. It was lovely, I loved it. Because I could, I knew that I could go buying, I went to New York to buy, or bought in Miami, the better market of Miami. <coughs> and that was great. So, where I had my store, we were six stores. So the owner that owned the six stores sold this was after three years when I had my shop. 
sold all the stores, and we all had to get out. I think we had something like three months to vacate. So well, I had to sell all my stocks, sell all my fixtures and everything. And I'm out. Nothing, you know, I'm, well, I'm out. I'm no, no, no store, no nothing. But I couldn't stay idle. So at that time, Dania Highline opened. I got a job as a cashier there. So I was a cashier during the highlight season. I was a cashier at Highline. So you went full circle, more or less. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Could, I, I never stayed idle. If you uh, had to tell uh, younger people today about your experience and give them some advice about the military, what would you tell them? Go by all means. Go okay. in. Keep your eyes open and your mouth shut. And the discipline and you think you is learn. the thing. That's, that's how, how you learn. Well, that's how mm -hmm. I learned what everybody else was mm -hmm. doing. When I, when I, I was, I wasn't even 16 years old. I think when, when the family moved to New York at that time. And uh, at that time, in 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 dress showrooms, the models. They didn't have zippers in those days. They had buttons. You buttoned them. So I got a, a job in this wholesale house where the models, the salesmen would come in and pick out their clothing from the models. And the models, they, they were buttoned. And I used to help in the showroom to button the models. And we weren't, when we weren't busy in the showroom, I was in the office helping the bookkeeper. When I left there, I was an assistant bookkeeper. I watched what this girl did. And do you think your military service helped you when you get out in your when I got out in your life afterwards? They say that I'm still a sergeant. <laughs> very good. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Ms. Lehman. Is there anything else you would like to share with us? Well, I I enjoyed my experience. It was hard sometimes. It was hard because when I went in, they still didn't have uniforms for wax. They only had the men's size. Men's size shirt was a 14. My neck was a 12, 11 and a half. They didn't have, and this is January, and they didn't have uh, overcoats for us yet. And the overcoats were 14, and I'm 10 or 11, I don't know. So it made it hard, you know, wearing the clothes until they finally got more women in and more smaller sizes mm -hmm. for us to put up. So you saw the, saw the wax develop? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. And uh, then, then you're very proud. In fact, my father when I would come home on furlough or a weekend, he'd take my shoes and he'd start polishing my shoes. He was so proud. His soldier, his soldier. Very proud. Yeah. And it makes you feel proud. I mean, you put on that shirt with the tie, you know. And today when you see uh, military personnel. Oh, I envy them. <laughs> Especially the girls. I want to get right back in uniform, right back in step, you know. And when you hear the Star Spangled Banner, forget it, the tears start going. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing your story oh, with us. Oh, my goodness. I enjoyed it. I think that you had a you unique have, experience. You have to come to my apartment. You know, everybody has a Hall of Fame. I have a Wall of Fame. A wall of fame. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have a wall of fame. Ask her what she's been doing the past 25 years. What? what have you been doing the last 25 years, Ms. Lieben? The Europe. opera. Oh, I, um, how did I get to the opera? Oh, uh, 
um, my sister that is since this is deceased was an opera singer. And so we always had music in the house. And uh, you came to take care of her. Oh, and oh yes. In between, I got another job that I worked for 15 years with a security company in Miami Beach, the Andy Frank Security. If you're from Chicago, you'd know the Andy Frank Service. No, I'm not from Chicago. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I got a job with them in the office with Andy Frayne, and then I was the head of the whole office. And, but I had a sister live, my, that same Dennis, my, my mother passed. In the meantime, I had a sister who was very ill, lived in Atlanta, and every month, every few weeks, I'd get an SOS come up to Atlanta because they thought it was the end until they decided that her money and my brother-in-law, their money is gone, the nurses, sitters, nursing homes, and the rest of the family, they were all married with children. I was the only one that had nobody. So it was up to me to come to Atlanta to take care of her, give up my job in Miami Beach, and I came to Atlanta. I stayed with her for two years, until she passed away, and my she passed away. Three weeks later, my brother-in-law passed away, the two of them. So here I am in Atlanta, although I had a niece here who since then met someone married, and she's here. So instead of going back to Miami Beach where I had no one, I thought, well, I'll stay in Atlanta because I still have a niece here. But I'm not doing anything. Nobody needed me, and here I was needed day and night. Until I saw an ad in the paper, volunteer needed for the Atlanta Opera. I answered that ad. I'm still there. I'm You're still, still there. at the opera? Yes, sir. And although, what are you doing? Although I had a setback a few months ago. I had a little heart attack. I have a little of this. That's what the doctor said. And uh, so I've been home. I haven't been to my office, mm -hmm. but I'm in touch with my office. My official title, and I'm a volunteer there now 24 years. Wonderful. And my official title is audition coordinator. In other words, if you're a singer and you want to sing with the Atlanta Opera, you send me your resume, and then I go with Fred Scott, who is our artistic director, and we, he picks who he wants to hear. And uh, I'm in touch with my office, of course, but I haven't been really to the office. But I've got I told an honorary them. board but, member of the office. Yeah. yeah. So this is in keeping with your idea of keeping busy. You right. continue to be busy. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So then when I got sick these last few weeks, whatever it is, they, I am now living in an assisted living where I assist others. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. You're welcome very much. I enjoyed it. And this will be